Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying uh, your lunch. I would like to uh, interrupt your conversations briefly. I hope you've been enjoying the morning as much as I have. And uh, uh, now I would like to introduce our intellectual dessert for lunch. Um, so uh, it, it is my, real, my great honor and privilege to introduce uh, Kai Fu Lee, uh, Chairman and CEO of uh, Sinovation uh, Ventures. Now Kai Fu has a very long history of uh, contributions in AI, starting with his uh, PhD uh, degree, which was the first speaker independent continuous speech recognition system ever. Um, so after he got his PhD, Kai Fu was a professor at Carnegie Mellon and held various executive positions at Apple, Microsoft, Google, and eventually um, started, off his, uh, started his um, venture fund, uh, which is currently uh, named Sinovation Ventures. Kai Fu is uh, a beloved AI researcher in China and beyond. Uh, please welcome him. Thank you, Daniela. This morning when I came to the conference, the, um, the Uber driver asked me what kind of event I was going to. And I said, AI in the future of work. So he said, so how long before th these autonomous vehicles replace my job? And then I, and I said, um, well, this is the US. So, m so I thought maybe 15 to 20 years. He uh, breathed a sigh of relief and said, well, I'll be retired by then. <laughs> It was uh, good that I wasn't asked that question in China because I would probably be forced to say more like 10 years. So this talk will give you some reasons as to why I have such optimism about the future of AI in China, as well as some concerns. So I will try to cover technology, market, product, capital, and policy around AI. It's not a technology talk, but we always have to begin with technology because many of you are probably thinking of all the Turing Award recipients in AI, of all the deep learning inventors, of all the triple AI fellows, well, there aren't that many Chinese. It's a very clearly American, and some would say American and Canadian, uh, led group of uh, elite top super AI researchers, and we had the privilege of hearing from one of them this morning. But I want to tell you that <clears throat> while the very, very top certainly is still dominated by American researchers, when you start to look at China, uh, the numbers are growing um, unbelievably fast. And I get a little bit of credit for that, for having started Microsoft Research Asia, which, um, was that for me? <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. You remember those days when we were at Microsoft. And there are now 5,000 people trained by that organization. And, and the core work that we did was AI. Um, and you can see the nine people listed are sent basically CTOs at Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, um, uh, Total, and uh, Hire, Lenovo, basically all the big names. Uh, some are CTOs, some are you know, heads of AI. Basically, the knowledge has spread to uh, help the Chinese companies move into the age of AI. And there's a lot of new uh, 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 people in their 30s and 40s, and I show some of them here, who are quite well known. Uh, they're you know, committee chairs on, on CVPR and uh, conferences like that. And, and also the young people actually are jumping into AI uh, at a speed that would be hard to believe. A short story about um, uh, 10 years ago, the uh, dean of Tsinghua uh, School of Management, Economics and Management told me, well, this year, the top, super top smart people, more of them picked business school than computer science. He said it quite proudly. Um, and that was, I think, 2005. And I asked him what was the reason. And he said, well, Goldman Sachs started paying global salaries in China. So that single small, insignificant, unimportant, basically irrelevant information was enough to move half of the Zhuangyuan those of you who are Chinese know this. The provincial number one scorer at the national entrance exam went to the School of Economics and Business. And of course, they've all come back <laughs> at now the age of AI. All the Zhongyuan pretty much select computer science as their area. And I recently um, talked to a bunch of graduates and I said, hey, how many, why do you want to work on AI? And they said, well, it pays more. 
And I said, how much more does it pay? And they said, about 50%. So these guys know <laughs> their numbers. And I'm not saying all Chinese students are economically motivated, but it is an important element. So if you take it as an, an example, there are many such examples. Uh, one of the companies I talked about, we fund, proudly fund this morning, is uh, called Face++. Plus Plus. Um, this year, uh, actually uh, one week ago, there were the three category winner of the Microsoft, Coco, and Places image competition, uh, beating some of the top industrial teams in the world. Uh, their chief scientist, uh, Sun Jian, um, is, uh, was the invent one of the inventors of ResNet, which is one of the technologies used in AlphaGo Zero. And this company is valued well over a billion dollars, uh, and uh, they're recognizing three million faces at any given time, deployed everywhere, used commercially in uh, security applications, um, as well as uh, since I iPhone X has come out with the uh, capability, uh, a number of Chinese top phone manufacturers are rushing to <laughs> match iPhone. I can't name who they are, but they're basically all of them. <laughs> and uh, most of them have chosen Face++ Plus Plus technology. And they don't have the fancy uh, 3D um, um, uh, technology that iPhone has, but for ID, hey, you don't need it. So this is an example where face recognition is legitimately um, won by the Chinese companies. There are a few other companies who are really at the top. And they win because they focus on it, it's hard work, it's not necessarily you know, brilliant paper publishing, but it's really getting that paper to work pragmatically in real applications with huge amounts of data and laborious labeling that were initially manual and eventually automatic. So that kind of dedication is uh, very like Chinese companies. And here is an example uh, in face recognition. Uh, in my old field, speech recognition, uh, Baidu and uh, iFlyTech uh, both claim to have a nuanced Google level of capabilities for, for the respective languages. So the Chinese uh, industrial companies in applications are really catching up in the technologies. But really, what about the papers? So if you were looking um, as like 10 or 12 years ago, there are there are a small number of Chinese um, authors, but now the citations are up to um, sorry, it's misspelled. Citations are up to 53% of all papers published were ethnically Chinese authors, and 43% of the authors, way more than the Chinese percentage as a percentage of the world population. So the top top ones are not yet Chinese, but the the medium ones are quickly emerging. And this is selecting from the top publications, not any publication. So technology is definitely behind, but catching up, and huge numbers are uh, jumping in. And what about the market? <clears throat> As we heard this morning, the size of the data set is incredibly important to the AI algorithms. Um, AI algorithms, most of them are open source and well known. You do need a few smart people to tweak them, but to apply them, uh, this uh, network effect, <coughs> virtuous cycle effect happens by having first you have more, if you have more data, you have a product that's better trained with AI, which will get you more users that will make you more money and then you'll hire more scientists, buy more machines and get yet more data. This cycle is, has been the success factor of Facebook, Google and Microsoft and in China, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba and many, many others. Um, there, we had a saying in speech um, that Victor and Jim would <laughs> remember well. Uh, there's no data like more data. I think this is attributed to uh, Fred Jelinek. Um, and and uh, more data really makes things better. The graph on the left basically shows um, the content's not that important. But what it shows is when you increase the data, the horizontal axis, each of the algorithms dramatically improve in accuracy. Whichever algorithm you pick, as long as they're you know, reasonable choices. So believing that a super scientist can do magic on a particular given AI problem, that just isn't the case. A very good scientist with a ton of data will beat a super scientist with a small amount of data any day. So with that, how much data does China have? We all know China has the world, uh, is a, has the most users in mobile and internet. So you would probably think, oh, that's 3X, that's significant. That means China has an edge because some mobile users for the, you know, Baidu will have more than Google queries and uh, Alibaba will have more than Amazon transactions by maybe a factor of three for US and China, just considering for now,
the respective countries, not worry about the global expansion and so on. You think the ga gap is a factor of three? It is absolutely not a gap of three. It is dramatically larger than that. Here I give you two examples. Uh, one is the Chinese phone mobile payments. Uh, the Chinese people use the phone to pay for the goods um, 50 times more often than Americans. Uh, that is bypassing, the, when, you, when you whip out your phone rather than your credit card or cash to pay, that's phone payment, 50 times more. All of that is data that goes back to train AI models. Uh, Chinese food delivery, uh, 10 times more than the US. Uh, I don't have time to go into the specifics as to why, but it's, I'm just saying the proliferation of mobile as, an, as a point to life, online and offline, is happening much faster than in the US. If you actually go to China, spend a day, I mean spend a day with a Chinese person, you will be amazed at what people do. Uh, they carry, the Chinese people carry no cash. Um, they just take a phone and you pay all your utilities with your phone. You buy everything with your phone. Uh, you, get, you, you don't go to restaurants, you just order out. It gets delivered, you go off work, open your phone app, order food by the time you're home. Food is right there, hot off, uh, off the electrical motor, motorbike with uh, free delivery. So these are examples where China is dramatically changing and leapfrogging the way that mobile is and should be used. And here is another example, shared bicycles. Most of what you read in the US about shared bicycles is simply wrong. Shared bicycle is a phenomenal um, product that is bringing value to the user, it's making the environment better, it's, um, and it's going to have a business model that will make a lot of money. Uh, it does create a mess in the streets, <laughs> Uh, that needs to be fixed, but this graph shows you five of the apps and how long they took to get to 20 million orders per day. This is not a uh, daily active user. This is not a page view. This is dollars being spent. Imagine 20 million per day. Uh, how many US apps get that many orders? And how long does it take for a new app to get to that speed? Mobike, the, um, the shared bicycle company we invested in, took 10 months to get to go from nothing to 20 million orders, payments per day. So all of that is data. So when we talked about the three wave, four waves in the morning, this is the third wave. You've got 22 million bicycles transmitting their uh, GPS and other sensor information up to the server, uh, creating 20 terabytes of data that can be mined for all kinds of things. Uh, DD also transmits 20 million uh, shared, uh, I mean, uh, it's like Uber rides per day. And DD has been recently connected to the traffic lights, and it's dramatically reducing uh, the uh, amount of time it takes to go from place A to B by synchronizing the traffic lights in accordance with how many people are going into which way. So all of these things will be data that will drive, uh, that will uh, make existing uh, products, applications more efficient, and they will enable new applications we've never thought of. So um, a moment on mobile payment, um, just, just because this is so important, even though it's not directly on the AI topic. When your phone is able to make mobile payments, here are the things that happens. First, understand what a mobile payment is. First, uh, it's not like a credit card. There's no 3% charge by the bank. It's basically frictionless, basically free. Secondly, it's peer-to-peer. Any of us can pay anyone else. You don't have to be a merchant or a customer. And, um, <clears throat> and, and, it's, and thirdly, it's instantaneous. So there's no wait for the credit card verification approval. When this happens, this will make huge changes. It will make uh, previously Chinese, chi Chinese and China are a savings economy. It will become a spending economy because it's so easy to spend uh, so um, basically just something you want to buy, you'll buy it. And also it's so easy to take a loan. And that's why we were able to fund this company that does smart loans. They're doing 30 million loans per year. This is just one company and there are 10 of them, right? 30 million loans because there are no credit cards. So by China was behind because US had the world's best payment infrastructure called credit cards. But China being behind got a chance to leapfrog. And that's happened over the past um, just two or three years. Now it's, um, it's, it's basically used everywhere. <clears throat> and what will happen next is you're probably thinking a lot about Amazon acquiring Whole Food. 
but we think that is a uh, rather primitive activity. In China, online and offline are merged completely. Um, there are companies um, that are basically able to track offline users and transmit their behavior online to be fully integrated with online activities. So to make that clear, you know when you browse on Amazon, Amazon knows what page you're on, what you clicked, what you bought, what you didn't buy, and who you are, what you've bought in the past. But imagine that happening in real life, right? If the stores and shopping malls used video cameras and other sensors and really knew what you did and transmitted up, up, uh, up to the um, data servers, it will be able to online and offline make stronger predictions on what you want. It will submit that to the stores so they buy the right inventory, and then the stores will cause the right supply chain to happen and new products will be designed based on users. So all the loop will be connected and that will happen in not just consumption but also in, uh, in education, in, uh, in many, many other areas. So this is something that's happening in China. I just wrote a piece for The Economist on this topic. I think this will be a phenomenal change that while Amazon Go is the most uh, advanced, technologically advanced example in China, uh, autonomous stores are uh, really coming up uh, everywhere. And I would guess in another year when you go to China, the chances are um, half your shopping will be going through semi-autonomous or autonomous stores. So this is the speed at which Chinese um, companies implement things. So what about product? Can Chinese people build good products or good AI products? Uh, many of you probably still remember the days when China was nothing but copycats, and that is something that definitely was the case 15 years ago. Everything was a copycat. Every single good startup was a copycat. But by first copying, um, I don't mean IP theft, I just mean copy the look and feel and the functionality uh, from you know, Yahoo to Sina, from Google to Baidu, and so on. But that copying taught the entrepreneurs how to build products to suit users. They became good product managers. And then they, that very quickly they went to the next stage where they were inspired by American innovation still, but then they built features on top of that. So Weibo was a better product and is a better product than Twitter today. And um, Zhihu is a better product than Quora, Quora today. And Taobao is a better product than, than eBay today. And WeChat is a better product than Facebook Messenger today. Um, not that they were original, but they evolved quickly based on a large market and feedback. So that's the second column. The third column is now that uh, fortified with all that knowledge building new products, the Chinese companies are coming out with brand new innovations, products not seen in America. Shared bicycle is an example. Uh, Total is a customized news. Uh, at, when I was at Google, we tried for years to target news, but Total managed to do it before Google. Um, so it would be too hard to explain, so I won't bother. <laughs> VIP Kid is a uh, distance learning, connecting the underpaid American teacher to the uh, desiring to learn English uh, Chinese student. Mobike is a shared bicycle, and our sponsor, uh, and Financial, I didn't put it here because they're the sponsor, uh, came up with a lot of financial products, including helping you to gain a higher interest rate than the bank uh, because you use them for the transactions. So, and of course, naturally, what comes next is um, copy from China becomes, uh, sorry, copy uh, to China becomes copy from China and other products are using Chinese features and inspiration. So the Chinese products, at least for mobile, are every bit as good and generally better than the American counterpart. So it's not surprising to see the Chinese company valuations are at US levels. So add these up together and they'll be roughly comparable. There are obviously cases where Google is more expensive than Baidu, but there are also cases where Meituan is much more expensive than Yelp. So Chinese companies are matching American uh, valuations. So what about, and the products have to be good to, for that. So let's come back to our four waves and evaluate. Product to product, product wise, are Chinese AI products gonna leapfrog American ones? And I will make some predictions. In the first wave using internet data, um, I think, generally speaking, Chinese internet companies will leapfrog the American ones. Uh, not, not every single case, and the, re the reason is when you have mobile and payment, when everyone, new innovations will come up because everyone can pay. There will be so many ways to make money, using the loan as an example. And also, uh, BAT, the Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, unlike Facebook, Microsoft, and Google, uh, are less restricted by antitrust laws. Um, 
and are tenacious in terms of territory expansions. So every one of them is going to have a bank, an insurance company, and so on and so forth, much faster than the, the uh, American counterparts. So I'm, I feel that uh, value of data and value of uh, higher quality AI will help the internet companies grow. Second wave, commercial data, that's China lags the US, largely because large traditional Chinese companies never bothered to data warehouse their important content. Or if they did, they did a very poor job. So for them to turn that into value is extremely difficult. Whereas uh, companies like you know, Element.ai, IBM Watson, Palantir, are able to sell AI software on top of structured data stored by the American companies. The Chinese companies have yet to structureize their data, and that will take time. But the government is pushing them, policies are pushing them forward, and there is a chance to catch up in the future, but not, not for now. The third wave, digitizing the real world, I think China will leapfrog the US. I gave the shared bicycle example. So much more GPS and data is being transmitted. There's less concern about privacy. And also, it's about hardware, right? It's about building out the sensors. And in China, everything is a lot cheaper. So Tianmao Jingling um, it, it essentially is a product like uh, the Amazon Echo. And it's now selling at $15 in China. Um, the cameras, uh, there's a company called Haikang Wei Shi, HK Vision. They sell $6 billion of uh, surveillance cameras in China. Uh, Six billion US dollars of revenue. And you figure out how many cameras there are. And those cameras are all capturing high quality video on which you can do recognition and uh, metadata gathering and AI predictions and face recognition. So those reasons, I think, generally speaking, will cause China to leap ahead. And then lastly, full automation uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of autonomous vehicles and robots. US is way ahead in technology. And by way ahead, we mean two years. That's really a long time. However, the Chinese companies are faster moving with government support, and also hardware production is lower cost. So we will see who uh, ends up being ahead. I would say it's 50-50 uh, at this point. So what about capital? I'll go quickly on this, on capital. Lots of money going in, lots of AI companies on the left. But very notable to see is the Chinese government matching fund has um, dramatically been increased to 353 billion in, uh, in last year. And wh what's a matching fund? A matching fund is the government becomes an LP in a VC fund uh, with a willingness to take a lower return than other LPs. That is an encouragement for the top VCs to take government money and spend less time raising money and more time building great companies. And it's uh, inspired by Israeli and um, Singaporean practices, which are very smart practices. And Chinese secondary market, somewhat similar to the US market, but much more with much uh, more, um, how shall we say this, uh, ir irrational exuberance, I guess, uh, than even the American market. Whenever a company is branded AI, um, even when it's not, the price goes crazy. So here I give an example of a company that actually has AI. It's uh, the only one I know. All the other ones I think are fake, but. but <laughs> But this one is a speech recognition company, every bit arguably comparable to Nuance, but look at the gap of the uh, market capitalization. It's now valued at $10 billion relative to Nuance, $4 billion, compared to just a few years ago, it was two to one the other way. And of course, HK Vision, the company that makes the, the cameras, uh, is now market cap $50 billion. And then a company that makes dancing toy robots is valued at $5 billion, and so on and so forth. So a lot of capital flowing in, obviously creating some bubble, but also lots of fuel and lots of motivation for young, smart people to go and do AI. So lastly, what about the government programs? Um, the government program, probably the most significant report came out July of this year, and contrasted with Obama's uh, report uh, one year ago. Uh, you'll see that Obama's report was very um, um, rational um, and uh, very reasoned about long-term resources, about regulations, about thinking about ethics and things like that. The Chinese report was very straightforward. By 2020, catch up on AI technology and applications. By 2030, become a global AI innovation hub. Okay, and, <clears throat> and more recently, and it's typical of the five-year planning uh, approach China has taken. And more recently, in the 19th Congress speech, uh, uh, President Xi Jinping, in his speech, and quoted among, probably among the top five quotes of that entire 200-minute uh, speech, 
okay? There may be five quotes repeated, but this is like the State of the Union address in the U.S. Uh, the, one of the five quotes was that uh, develop advanced manufacturing, promote further integration of the internet, big data, artificial intelligence with the real world economy. So he gets what we're talking about in terms of AI and the virtual world and real world combining. And if you're wondering, a white paper, does it actually have any teeth? Well, the Chinese uh, policies generally are very well executed. Uh, in 2010, China claimed it'll be the world's leader in high-speed rail. Many people were skeptical. In six years, 60% of the worldwide high-speed rail trains are in China. And then in 2015, uh, per, uh, Premier Li Keqiang declared a program called Shuangchang. And Shuangchang in English is Mass Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship and Innovation Movement. It's about making everybody should be an entrepreneur. It's um, rather, uh, uh, how should we say, um, uh, strong maybe in pushing everyone to do that. But let's just look at the result. The result is in China, there are now 8,000 incubators, accelerators, up from 1,700 in just one and a half years. And there are 156 uh, high-tech science parks. So we can expect that the AI steps will turn into real. There are several company, uh, cities talking to us and some of it is quoted on uh, uh, at Financial Times. And generally speaking, I think it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that municipal governments of second and third tier cities are prepared to put in $100, $200 million to an incent AI companies from setting up in that city. So that's going to end up with results. And the last point I'll make is that Chinese government in general is pro-tech, right? When Alibaba came out, there were questions about, you know, how to deal with taxes, how to deal with um, uh, can, can Alibaba go into banking and licenses and things like that. Chinese government has proven that when new technology comes out, they'll give it benefit of the doubt, let it grow for a while. If it takes off, then come back and look at it as opposed to use policies to forbid things. And then on the right, uh, the Chinese environment is more conducive for fast launch, fast iteration. I'm not making a comment that this is good or bad. I'm just stating a fact. This morning, we heard a lot about cons ethical considerations, bias issues. I think in China, the general belief is just launch something, get it iterated. There are problems, we'll fix it. And we'll get data and get better over time. And that spirit, I think, will launch China forward. Um, uh, and again, not commenting on whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, but will launch China forward to become a very strong AI power so in conclusion, I think in this age of AI, the US-China duopoly is just not, and I wouldn't say it's inevitable, it, is, it has already arrived. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kai Fu, for this energizing talk. I am so energized, and I hope so are you. And, this, and in this age of accelerated everything, I would like to ask you to accelerate your way back to the other auditorium. We are already half an hour behind program, so.